waves. So we have a couple of goals for this session. First we'll simply introduce waves and then we'll go over the equation we used to describe a basic traveling waves wave. So waves, what is a wave anyway? Well, it's a disturbance that carries energy from one place to another. So how do we classify waves? We have a couple of different ways, but here's one way to do it. So we can divide waves up into mechanical waves, such as water waves, sound waves, waves on strings. A wave that requires a medium through which to travel. Note that there's no net flow of mass through the medium, only a flow of energy. And then we have electromagnetic waves, such as light, x-rays, microwaves, radio waves. They're just different frequency ranges of the same kind of wave. They don't need a medium, which is lucky for us. We can get lots of energy from the sun, and that energy can pass through to us through the vacuum of space, for instance. And then we have matter waves, waves associated with things like electrons, protons, and other tiny things we usually think of as particles. Okay, it's really the first category we're going to concern ourselves with here. Now, another way to classify waves is as transverse waves versus longitudinal waves. Okay, so the picture down at the bottom shows a transverse wave. The particles in the medium oscillate in a direction perpendicular to the way the wave itself is traveling. And a good example is a wave on a string. So the wave itself is traveling to the right, but the particles in the medium are just going up and down. That's a transverse direction to the way the wave itself is going. As opposed to longitudinal waves. Now, longitudinal waves, the particles in the medium oscillate along the same direction as the way the wave is traveling. A good example of a longitudinal wave is a sound wave. Okay, so once again, the wave itself is traveling to the right. There is no net flow of particles to the right, notice, but the particles in the medium oscillate back and forth, left and right, parallel to the way the wave itself travels. And there's a good connection between waves and simple harmonic motion. So if you have a single frequency transverse wave, like this one at the bottom that's shown, every particle in the medium experiences simple harmonic motion. So the motion is given by this equation, y as a function of time is a sine omega t plus phi, a being the amplitude, uh, omega being the angular frequency, and then we have this thing, the phase, and that's the thing that really varies from one point to another. Okay, so you can see there's two particles that have been colored in, one at the very left-hand side and one a little bit to the right of that. And they're doing exactly the same thing as one another, just one is delayed with respect to the other. Okay, so it's the phase part of the equation that determines that delay. The more to the right you are, the more that lag in uh, what one particle does compared to the other. Okay, so every particle is exhibiting simple harmonic motion, and so you know, to make this movie, you might say, well, I had to simulate something like, you know, 100 particles, there must be 100 equations. Well, nicely, you can use a single equation. That's pretty powerful. Okay, so each particle oscillates with the same amplitude and frequency with its own phase angle. Note that for a wave that travels right, particles to the right lag behind particles to the left in time, that is. And so the phase difference is proportional to the distance between the particles. So we see the motion at the particle at uh, x equals zero is given by this, you know, just a sine omega t with no phase. Then one of, at a position x instead of zero is given by a sine omega t minus kx. The phase angle is a negative because that particle is delayed compared to the one at the origin, and b proportional to the distance from the origin, proportional to x. Now, this thing k is known as the wave number, not to be confused with the spring constant, which is a different thing. 
And this one equation, y of x of t equals a sine omega t minus kx, describes the whole wave. It's one equation for the whole darn thing. Okay, so again, just to summarize, uh, we have a single frequency transverse wave. The motion of the entire string is given by y of x of t is a sine omega t plus or minus kx. Got your angular frequency, your amplitude, and your wave number. Uh, use the positive sign if the wave is going left and the negative sign if the wave is going to the right. Uh, note that omega is connected to the period. The omega, the angular frequency, that's 2 pi over the period. Uh, K, in a similar way, is 2 pi over the wavelength. Okay, so what exactly is this K thing anyway? So a particle at a distance of one wavelength away from another particle would have a phase difference of 2 pi. They would oscillate together, but one is like a full cycle behind. In other words, kx is 2 pi when x is lambda, so the wave number is simply k times lambda is 2 pi, k is 2 pi over lambda. Note that the wave number is related to wavelength the same way the angular frequency is related to the period. Okay, so that's omega is 2 pi over t. Now, consider this. Top picture is a photograph. The bottom picture is going to show a graph of a single point, what it does. To determine wavelength, do we do the photograph, the graph, or both? Well, here's the graph. So think about what we need. And, of course, the wavelength can just come straight off the photograph. Well, is the graph good for everything? Anything? What about determining the period? Well, that comes from the graph. Okay, so wavelength we get from a photograph of the wave itself, frozen in time, and the period we get from plotting what one little point on the wave does as a function of time. Okay, that is it for this video.